how large this is half degree by half degree? Yeah, so typical, the, the, I don't know how old this figure is, but a typical GCM at this point is s sort of 200 kilometers using a grid cell that's say about 200 kilometers on a, on a side. Some of them are finer. The Japanese have one that's a high resolution GCM, uh, but the resolutions have come down, but they're still uh, you know, in the hundreds of kilometers in terms of horizontal resolution. And so what you need to do if you want to, res so, oh, what happened? Where did my slide go? Um, so th this is what that looks like sort of spread over North America. Sorry, this is North America centric, but if you can picture what North America looks like, we have some mountains in the east, we have the Rocky Mountains in the middle and, and the Sierras in California, and a typical global climate model has such a coarse resolution that it doesn't really see any of these mountains very much. It just sees sort of a lump of higher elevation in the middle of North America where the Rockies are. And that's obviously not a very great way to represent climate because we know mountains are really important in climate, right? Winds blow up against mountains, uh, clouds form, orographic rainfall happens because of mountains. All, all sorts of things happen because of mountains. So it would be nice if we could have a higher resolution that represented the topography better. Also, lots of climatic things happen along coastlines. This is obviously a really highly schematic version of the North American coastline. If we could resolve that coastline better, we'd get much better sort of climate model outputs. So what climate scientists do is take a global climate model and run it, and then put a much finer meshed model inside of that model. So think about this model being run for the entire globe, but embedded in that model is a square that represents North America at finer resolution. So it, you know, it still doesn't look great, but you can see Hudson Bay finally. Florida looks like Florida a little bit, and you can see that the, the Rockies are represented and the Sierras are represented, so you finally have your mountains. So um, if you're doing a climate study of, on species, you might want to look for a regional climate model, which is what this is. So this is called a regional climate model. It's a climate model run for the region, but it's run inside of a global climate model because it needs to get information at all of its edges about what's happening um, in the climate around it in order to simulate what happens in climate over the region. So you wind up with a coarse scale model with a fine scale model clipped into the middle of it and that gives you a better sense of what's happening with climate in your region of interest. So one thing to know about climate modeling is to look for regional climate models. They may or may not be available for your region and you probably want to complement them with global climate models because there won't be very many regional climate models available so that increases the amount of uncertainty you have because you, you're not able to, to ask whether models are agreeing with each other or not. Okay, so global climate models, regional climate models, important tools. Bilal mentioned emission scenarios. So all of these models need to know <laughs> how much greenhouse gases are going into the atmosphere in order to simulate warming. Um, and in order to do that, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has developed a series of emission scenarios. Uh, and there's an old version of emission scenarios uh, known as SRES scenarios. And they typically have names like A2 and B2. And then there's a newer version of emission scenarios called the Representative Concentration Pathways, which are, have names like RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5. So just a, a thing to look for as, as you think about climate modeling is if the emission scenario is named RCP something, that means it's a more recent emission scenario, a more recent climate model. If it's named something like A2 or B2, it means it's an older climate model. But those emission scenarios are important because we don't know exactly 
how much greenhouse gas we're going to put in the atmosphere. We know we haven't really s reduced the amount that we're putting into the atmosphere very much at all yet, uh, but we think that depending on how the, the planet develops, how many economies become high uh, fuel intensive economies, uh, we could either have very high emissions or we could have more moderate emissions. So there are always different emission scenarios used in, in climate modeling. Uh, the short course on which emission scenario to use is the highest one available because we are exceeding even the highest emission scenarios that the IPCC has devised. So uh, you always pick one with a higher number. If you're in the RCP series, look for the RCP 8.5 one and that's as high as you can go. So that's sort of the the scenario that says we're putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as fast as we can and that indeed is what is happening. So if there's great success in Paris this month, we may find that lower emission scenarios are appropriate and we have to start uh, using lower emission scenarios and that would be great. But for the time being, uh, the world hasn't really curtailed its greenhouse gas emissions at all and the highest emission scenarios are the ones to use. Okay, so that gets us just a little bit about global climate models, regional climate models. Yes, question. Does it use uh, the variables or what type of variables? Uh, okay, what sorts of variables do these models use and what do they re reproduce? So these models are interested in weather essentially. So they're interested in warming, they're interested in temperature, and they're interested in precipitation. So in order to look at precipitation, the models track um, water vapor, okay? So if we go back to our schematic of this model, these physical equations in this computer model are going to be asking how much water vapor comes into this cell, how much of it rains out of this cell or moves to a lower cell, how much of it moves on to a neighboring cell. So you can think of that sort of as the model modeling clouds and if it rains then the cloud disappears, the water, the water vapor is reduced. So the model's tracking water vapor and then it's looking at um, temperature, it's looking at incoming solar radiation, uh, the incoming sunlight interacts with the Earth's surface depending on the, whether the Earth's surface reflects or absorbs. That's going to determine how much heat is generated at the Earth's surface and that heat, that heat energy is also tracked in the model. So each grid cell will keep track of how much energy comes into it, how much passes out in each direction and uh, that's just how weather models and climate models work. Does, does that answer your question? Okay, and then the model, what the model gives us are estimates of temperature and rainfall generally at the surface of the planet. That's what we're interested in is what's the temperature going to be at the surface, how much rainfall is a particular place going to get. But the models have incredible amounts of information <laughs> about how much water vapor there is in the atmosphere, essentially how cloudy it is. Most of that information isn't saved and we only save information about what's going on at the surface of the planet. Any other questions? Sorry? Yeah, so um, there are several regional models, sorry, several regional models for Africa. I don't know of all of them, uh, but the University of Leeds runs several for West Africa and East Africa in a project called Impala, which I can't remember what it stands for. And then uh, the University of Cape Town, uh, Bruce Hewitson's lab, uh, runs uh, regional climate models, tend to be more for southern Africa and over into Madagascar, but they also have some, I believe, that cov cover all of sub-Saharan Africa. There is no for North Africa. <coughs> Sorry? There is no for North Africa. Uh, North Africa, I think, is included with some of the West Africa model and leads, but I don't, I, I'm sure there are, because they're Mediterranean models, and I'm sure North Africa is included in those Mediterranean regional models, but I don't happen to know what, what those are. Um, and the best way to find out if a regional model exists for your region is just to go to a professor of climatology or meteorology at 
your local university and ask them because they'll almost certainly know what regional models are, are being run for your region. Um, okay, so we're going to take a small jump here uh, because where this usually goes is to our CAPE models. But if you remember, we use these types of models in our species distribution models, right? You remember we use the species occurrence points and the climate models to create simulations of where the species might currently find suitable climate and where it might find suitable climate in the future. So that's the core of uh, some uh, biological modeling um, of, or modeling a biological response to climate change. Although there's several other kinds of models, we won't probably go into those. But let's go over then and look at how we might use some of those species models to answer questions about the possible impacts of climate change. Here's a neat graphic to begin with. Here's a, a, a frog on a very, <laughs> very hot planet. So let's ask how we can use some of these models to look at how species and ecosystems may respond to climate change. But let's first look at some ex experimental results just very quickly because we t we've talked a lot about models, but I don't want to give you the impression that models are the only thing in this field. Certainly experiments are important as well. And so let's look at a couple of them. So one thing people like to do is try to increase the temperature around individual plants or in ecosystems. Um, and you can do that in some quite simple ways. This is just a plexiglass circle with an open top. Uh, it acts like a miniature greenhouse. It concentrates a little bit of heat around the, the plant that it's surrounding. Uh, so here's a lar larger version of this very simple open top cone that's used for warming experiments. Um, does anybody know why it's open topped? Why don't they just put, put a plexiglass dome over something and then it'll heat it up just like a greenhouse? Why would they leave the top open like this? What comes in from above that plants care about? Yeah, yeah pre precipitation. So uh, in this particular experiment, they want to warm this plant, but they want it to sort of still experience the, the rainfall pattern that it's used to. So you leave the top open so the rain can get in. You don't change the amount of moisture the plant's getting very much, but you warm it up a bit. So that's one sort of experimental manipulation people use. Uh, another sort of experimental manipulation is to build a, a laboratory setting where you can put a heat lamp above plants and then completely enclose them in plexiglass and then control the gases and the precipitation that's coming in so you can build sort of your own little biosphere and a little microcosm of, of climate and completely control climate from the gases to the precipitation to the temperature and see what happens to plant growth. And then finally, if you want to have a bit more natural setting, you can do transplantation experiments. Uh, in the, or, uh, sorry, wrong slide. Uh, here's, here's a bit more natural setting. So you've got heat lamps above uh, experimental boxes in this case, but you're no longer sort of inside in a completely controlled laboratory environment. So you're getting a bit more of the, the natural flavor of things. Uh, you can see the, the containers are getting bigger as well. So you can move from individual plants in a greenhouse setting to bigger things that include multiple plants of the same species or multiple species to simulate competition. And finally, you can do transplantation experiments where you build a box and put soil in it, but you take it to a lower elevation where it's warmer and you see how the plant